Hello and welcome to all the men and women of the West. I'm Joe, here with me is my co-host Dan. Hello and greetings. And today we're starting with Dragons of Autumn Twilight. We're going to read for the Chronicles, because why not, as part of a book club podcast for the channel. Hope you guys enjoy it. The book starts off so-so. To be honest, I'm not terribly fond of the Tika character. She could have gone somewhere, but nothing was ever really done with Tika as a character. I know she's got her fan base before you hit the unsub button. And I know Margaret Waste loves her as a character, but it's just our opinion, and you're welcome to disagree with us in the comment section. But with other characters like Flint, Tath, Raislin, and Sturm. And Caramon. She vanishes to the back... Oh, and Tanith. And Tanith. She, she fades to the background. When I actually think there was a lot that could have been done with the character. She's the first character we see on the screen, so to speak, on page. To be quite honest, when I was first reading the first part, I thought, okay, so we're following the adventures of the companions for a bit, but they're going to be sidelined in part two of the book. When I saw the part two thing, I was like 13. I was like, we're going to go back to Tika and we're basically going to have a karate kid thing with her where she's actually the Luke Skywalker. Oh, that's interesting. No, no, nothing was done with her. Okay, well, part three, they have to use every character. Okay, no, they're not using Tika. Okay, Dragons of Winter Night, they have to use Tika. No, they're not, they don't. They gotta do something with the character. No, they don't. It's just a matter of, they never did anything with her. Outside of, she's just Caramon's arm candy, and it's like, the fans build her up a lot. The authors talk about her a lot. There's nothing that's done with the character, and that's something I'm a little butthurt about, because it's... Something should have been done with the character. Because there was potential there. Because she's basically the farm girl of the story. And I know Raceland, Caramon, and the rest are better characters. I kind of think the Chronicles should have been about her. It needed a main character. Instead, it had an ensemble cast. What they should have done was follow, have that cast, but from Tika's point of view. Tannis, Sturm being the main characters of Winter Night makes sense, but Tika should have also been main character. We find out, thanks to exposition, that a high theocrat dominates Solus, because he's a theocratic leader of Haven Solus. Tika is a 19-year-old girl who is unsatisfied with things. Otik is innkeeper who does not believe war is on the horizon. Sure, there are goblin patrols in the local area, Sure, there are rumors of armies gathering in the north, and you have more and more violence happening, but that's a coinky dink. He basically represents the average person who has done the ostrich thing, sticking their head in the dirt. None of that is important, because then we see Fizzman. I love Fizzman, who's just one of the best characters in this universe. I love Paladin. He's fun. Flint, when we're introduced to him in chapter one, griping and moaning about his house and whatnot, and his rheumatism, and trying to carve wood. Tannis then arrives teasing him and remarks that Raceland did expose some false clerics in Haven. Where we get the first glimpse of Tannis' character, if you've read Soul Forge, you're going to immediately notice there's a problem with Tannis' story saying, I did as much as Raceland did to expose those false clerics. Actually, Tannis did nothing. That's the thing. Tannis is claiming credit essentially for what Raceland and even to an extent Tass did. So right here, I'm not going to badmouth Tannis, but I am going to say this. We already find out he's not a reliable narrator. He is the sort of narrator who will lie to the reader. So you have to take what he says from his point of view in the story with a great deal of salt. You've got to bring truckloads of the stuff. Stuff that happens in some of the chapters that doesn't make sense. It's not consistent. Actually, it is. It's just you cannot trust the narrator. This is a old form of reading novels from the 19th century. And I've seen people blame it on Wace and Hickman not being very skilled authors in the early 80s. No, no, no. They're skilled authors. It's just you need to pay attention as a reader. They then next encounter Tass, who's glorious and fun. And Tath. Yeah. They then run into some goblins, and of course Tass goads the goblins. And then a fight ensues. They have to kill the goblins. Tass throws a dagger into the heart of a goblin who falls forward. Tannis offers to get Tass the dagger back, and Tass, who's sad, and says, No, you'll never be able to wipe out the stench from it. Besides, it was Flint's knife. <laughs> I love that scene. The next chapter sees the heroes arriving in the inn. Caramon is already there along with Raceland. Caramon is spotted by Flint, who complains that 
Raceland's surely nearby. There's a sense of foreboding that assails Tannis, especially once he sees Raceland in the shadows. And Raceland is amused by how disconcerted Tannis is at his appearance. Or I should say, horrified. Raceland does have a sick, demented side to him. The companions probably see the disfigurement of Raceland as confirmation that magic is evil and Raceland must be oppressed. As we've said in another video, you hate those you have abused in the past, as Dostoevsky once said. And that is very true when it comes to Raceland. The disfigurement of Raceland with the gold skin and whatnot is just simply taken as confirmation that they were right to bully him and mistreat him. One thing to comment, looking at Raceland, maybe magic is not a good thing. Yeah, which there is an argument to be made there. But to bully Raceland himself over that. Raceland... They, they don't have the entire story. It's implied that Caramon's kind of uncomfortable in this scene. Which, given what Raceland has done to Caramon a few years ago, yeah... That's fair. Raceland, though, does... We do have to criticize him because he's basically showing off his disfigurement to his old friends and taking sick sadistic pleasure in seeing them just cringe. It goes both ways. Oh, that's right. And Tika's introduced to the companions. And where the joke that Caramon once cracked was that she's so ugly her father's gonna have to pay someone to marry her. Which is also a sly wink and nod at what a dowry is. She delivers a note that Kitsiara's not showing up. And apparently the note says that Kitsiara sends her love to her brothers. <laughs> well, yeah, right. Like that sociopath loves anyone. Well, I should say psychopath. She's not a sociopath. Well, she loves someone. Herself? Yeah. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. It's true love. It's true love. Yeah, because she looked into a mirror and fell in love with the first person she saw in the mirror. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to be honest. I love Kitsiara as a villain. At the start of chapter three, Sturm shows up and has the natural response of being horrified by at Raceland's appearance, because what else will you feel? I but mean, here's where it's interesting. By all accounts, he does not react with, outside of a moment of just staring wide-eyed, he then resumes his stoic look and just shakes his head at Raceland a little, with a frown on his lips. Which shows he has a bit more self-control than some of the others who avert their gaze and look disgusted. Sturm simply just, he is disgusted, but he hides it better. With Raceland still amused, Raceland basically pokes his head out from the shadows just to scare the, try to scare the bejesus out of Sturm. I like to think that he's a little disappointed and that's why he slinks back into the shadows because Sturm was horrified but not scared because he's Sturm, bright blade, he's awesome. And it turns out Sturm is wearing his inheritance because the companions question him on, and what about your inheritance? I'm wearing all that's left of it, which is to say his hauberk and his sword. And, oh, and I guess his helmet, his war helmet. The trouble is Sturm has nothing left of his family. The castle's still there, but Sturm does not have any right to the castle anymore because the knighthood has pretty much taken it out of his hands and given it over to the crown guard family, his family rivals. He's got nothing left. If he was to sell either, he could probably raise an army to retake the castle, but that'd be disgracing his family name and getting rid of the last piece of inheritance he has left. So he has nothing left. It's ironic because if he was to sell his sword as a mercenary, he could probably raise the money. Well, by this time, he probably could have raised the money to retake the castle, but he didn't want to do that because that'd be dishonorable. Kudos to Sturm. Yeah, it means he's a bum, essentially, but kudos to Sturm Brightblade for holding to his morals and his ethical code. And I wouldn't judge him if he decided to become a fell sword over that. In some ways, he reminds me of Chosen from Cobra Kai, just with how much he sticks to his morals. We also find out that Sturm escorted some people in to the end. We get Gold Moon's song, but more importantly, the goblins and the local armies are looking for a blue crystal staff. Now, there's a large army gathering, according to Sturm, in the north to wage war probably against Salamnia. Now, in the northern part of Salamnia, that's dominated by Lord Soth, the Deaf Knight. So that means somebody has gotten Lord Soth's allegiance. In geopolitical terms, is horrible news for the entire world. Most sides, like the Selvanesti and the leaders of the Qualanesti, many of the leaders of Salamnia want to stick their heads into the dirt and just pretend that nothing's happening. Indeed. The only one who seems to realize the potential danger that's incoming is Lord Gunther. What did you think of these chapters? There's not much that happens thematically. They're building up Tannis. It's the old dungeon and dragons meet in a bar. It's done a little differently. This is a reunion of friends who haven't seen each other in a long time. Usually it's just first meetings in a bar. Here, this is not the first time they meet. These are childhood friends reuniting. And Raceland also <laughs> tags along. Because I knew you were going to point out, well, Raceland, they never treated him as a childhood friend. And of course, it has to be said. Okay, a couple of illiterate barbarians, a priest, and a knight walk into a bar. That is essentially how the story starts. The scene setting does 
when it comes to foreshadowing of Raceland. He is in the shadows. Where will he ultimately turn to? We get all the characters ignoring him, which I would argue is thematically hinting at how they're going to turn their backs on him. Except the only person who seems to be occasionally paying attention to him... Caramon. And Tika's basically just occasionally racing back to try and capture Caramon's attention. Much to Caramon's amusement and Raceland's probable disgust, Sturm tries to explain some of his adventures with Kitsiara. We don't actually learn much of it because Tannis is not listening, not paying any kind of attention. So I would be curious to find out what those adventures were like. There's a separate book about that. The trouble is, we get there another hint of Tannis being an unreliable narrator. He doesn't pay attention, so we don't find out what Sturm's been up to. Because Tannis doesn't care. Which, looking at the narrator from that point of view, you know, he's picking and choosing what to feed the audience. Reading this as an adult, I'm going, as a reader, I can't trust Tannis and what he says to me. He's a liar, and he ignores half the information that's fed to him. You have to be very careful with his chapters. The other main characters, I would argue, when it comes to Lorana, she's later a fairly unreliable narrator. She claims that her and Tannis were engaged. Tannis says we were kids and we were not technically engaged. The rest of her family confirms Tannis' side of the story. So Loran is a liar at that point. So we've got most of the narrators in the Dragonlance Chronicles who are not reliable. They're liars. Caramon's also a liar because he lies to women and cheats to get women into his bed. So he's not a reliable narrator either. So we've got essentially for a chunk of the Chronicles, a couple of characters who are liars by nature. The thing is, most of the cast are not reliable narrators. Arguably, Wace and Hickman use this to excellent effect. They do a fantastic job, and this is why the Chronicles are such a celebrated set of novels. There's a lot of intelligence put in, and this is one of their first books, and you can see that they're already weaving together a lot of falsehoods. Raceland can occasionally be an honest narrator. Raceland is typically honest with himself, not with others. But there are times when he'll lie to himself. And you can tell when he's lying to himself because it's really obvious. I would argue that the most reliable narrator of the companions is Sturm. Sturm, actually, the only thing he lies about is that he holds himself way too much to account. He is way too harsh with himself. That's the thing. Some of the Dragonlance novels out there have very reliable narrators. Huma, he's a very reliable one. You get to the, the heroes of the Lance are not reliable narrators. Like I said, that's just one of the most fascinating parts of the Chronicles. It's a marked contrast from, say, Lord of the Rings, where the narrators are very reliable, especially in regards to Raceland and Tass. Tass kind of lies to himself, but it's in the style of a kender. <laughs> so he's not a reliable narrator either. He's a kender. I think that's everything. I just had to go over the narrator stuff. But like I said, I really love this novel. I find it starts slow because they're just building up. Now, if you want the slowest fantasy novel to start, I'd say Dragonbone Chair. It takes 120 pages just to start the adventure. 120 pages of the best written fantasy literature out there. Dragonbone Chair starts off great, but it takes such a long time to start with. You do at times start to get a little exhausted. Lord of the Rings jumps into the quest lickety split and you're just left going wow it takes about three chapters i think and you're just you're racing and you're going whoa slow down frodo I, I need to catch up at least that's my opinion i find lord of the rings starts so fast hobbit starts at the end of the first chapter it's just off like a bullet he, tolkien wanted to just jump into the adventure what Wace and Hickman do is they kind of put them in the middle. Dragon Chair likes to start slow. Howard and Tolkien like to dive into the deep end. Wace and Hickman are jumping into the middle between the shallow and deep end. The thing is with this pub thing is it takes almost four chapters. Then the adventure kind of starts. After that, we have two chapters where they relocate to another place to, to talk. Essentially, this is a little slow to start with, but there are action set pieces. There, The adventure does start. You get enough that you're getting a sense of the world, but you also get to actually see the, the adventure at the same time. That covers it all. So if you enjoy this video, stay tuned for next time and smash that like and that subscribe button as though you were Crisania and Raceland shining their light and magic upon it.